Hey, Katie. Hey, Jesse. Are you uh, are you sitting down? I am sitting down. Yes. Okay, good. I've got some really bad news. We've been accused of of what I think is a very serious crime. Uh, what what crime is that? All right. Well, first of all, I'm Jesse Single, and I'm speaking with you, Katie Herzog. We're the hosts of Blocked and Reported, a podcast about stupid internet bullshit. Later on, we'll be talking about Katie's shotgun corona wedding and MAGA misinformation and the things Bernie Bros and Liz Lads have in common. Uh, We'll also talk about a Washington Post article tracking down the author of a very bad tweet. But first, this is only our second episode and already we face an existential threat. What did you do, Jesse? Okay, so after our pilot episode went up the other day, I started getting a bunch of angry tweets from fans of another podcast called Blocked Party. Have you heard of that? I am unfamiliar with Blocked Party. Or is it, are you saying Blocked Party or Block Party? Blocked. Block Party is a very good British sort of indie band, but that we'll talk about that some other podcasts. This is Blocked okay. Past Tense Party. So I hadn't heard of them either, but they're apparently a pretty big, successful podcast. They make seven grand a month on Patreon, which... I'm salivating thinking about it. Um, turns out That's their fans are – That is significantly more than we make. We will uh, we'll reveal our financials later, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the fans of Blocked Party are, are very angry and very obsessive, or at least a subset of them that announced themselves to me. And I – so I posted a link to our pilot episode, and they began tweeting at me very accusatorily, if that's a word – with various iterations of the same general message, which could be boiled down to, fuck you. (laughs) They were mad that the the name of our podcast, Blocked and Reported, sounds similar to the name of their podcast, Blocked Party. Okay, so the the rule is that you can only have one podcast with the word blocked in it, or is like our... Our podcast about the same thing. Did we like really rip them off or did we just rip off their name? I'm not going to lie. I didn't listen to their podcast. I'm not going to, but I went to their Kickstarter page. It sounds like they do things like one of their their bonuses for people who pay enough money is they tell stories about the times they got blocked on Twitter, which I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think there is no way we would make a story about getting blocked on Twitter exciting or listenable, right? That's not an area we're going to go to. I'm not even aware of when I'm when I'm blocked on Twitter. I mean, I usually find out because somebody that I've never heard of will tweet something and I'll realize that I can't see it. So there's not a very good story there. <laughs> right. So, yeah, the point being, I think we do fairly – I think we're going to do a fairly different thing. Um, but – Nonetheless, despite the lack of any sort of evidence that we're stepping on their toes, this this thing sort of escalated online. I was getting angry tweets. I think that the peak came when the co-host of that podcast said to me in a tweet, direct quote, you essentially stole our podcast. Essentially. We essentially, essentially stole it. Yeah. So we stand right. accused of, I, I believe in the federal criminal code, this is known as Grand Theft Podcast. <laughs> Grand Theft Audio. Yeah. <laughs> Grand Theft Audio. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Right. So, you know, I guess the question is what we should do. And one option is we just disband this podcast because we don't risk stepping on their toes. Oh, so I'm, you know what? I'm fine with that. I have lots of, I haven't watched Breaking Bad yet. Uh, I can watch The Wire again. You know, there's tons of, tons of stuff to do in quarantine. We don't have to do the show. (laughs) Right. Although on the other hand, I'm just spitballing here. We could just ignore this because it's really stupid and it's pretty obvious there are a thousand podcasts about internet drama and pretty clear that you can copyright the word blocked and its variants since, you know, just common internet lingo, right? Yeah, I'm fine with that too. I mean, uh, I can only watch so much TV before I go fucking crazy. <laughs> I like the idea that we're both just on the fence about whether we should actually do the podcast, but that's um, perhaps a conversation for another day. Well, you know what? The world is ending. The world is ending. It doesn't really matter how we spend our time, but... um. End of the day, this made for a very stupid afternoon for me on Twitter. I ignored my usual rule, which is to just not interact with certain types of people because there's no point and there's no way to win. Uh, I paid for my engagement with the fans of Blocked and Reported, or sorry, Block Party, <laughs> Block Party with wave after wave of very angry stupidity. Um, all that said, I want to give a quick shout out to my Twitter buddy, Logic Guy. He uses weird characters in his name, so I can't really describe how – I'll put a link in the show notes. He pointed out to me that he had a um, podcast he put on SoundCloud. The last episode was three months ago. Before that, it was two years ago. It it doesn't seem to be an active, ongoing concern, but it did have the name Blocked and Reported. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. I will link to his podcast. I recommend you guys check it out. We – I mean, you basically checked on – 
iTunes and Spotify that there were no other blocked and reported podcasts, right? Right. That was uh, the extent of my due diligence, which I honestly sounded like enough. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it was realistic for us to, to check every website. Uh, and I think anyone who searches us now will see, um, you know, it's where blocked and reported on those. Uh, and that name we should credit was suggested to us by Twitter user Keebtree. Uh, oh, and Boomy Leaks too. There were two of them. Yeah, but I think Boomy Leaks was actually okay, the first. Sorry about that, Boomy Leaks. You were the first. Anyway, so I sort of feel like um, we're in the clear. We've been investigated by a jury of our peers, namely the two of us, and found not guilty of, of Grand Theft Audio. <laughs> uh, well, you know, if anybody is going to judge us, it, it, it should be us. You know, this is this. I watched this unfold, and it was like – at the same time, very aggravating to like, I was watching you get dogpiled. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was very glad you were the one getting dogpiled and not me getting dogpiled. Um, but it was also like, for, and for some reason, it was also a little bit heartening because like, I've been feeling like the world is ending because in some ways the world is ending. And all of a sudden I got distracted from like this existential threat that we're facing by this like dumb internet bullshit. And for a little (laughs) while, everything felt normal. It felt like it was February again. And I could care about really dumb shit that doesn't actually matter instead of, you know, like the death of me and like everybody that I I love. (laughs) So I want to thank block party for that. The moment I felt most normal was when, Someone, a fan of Block Party with like 200 followers, just sort of an internet rando, tweeted like four really mean things at me. And I was about to go back at them and be like, no, fuck you. But then I checked their profile and it's like, it's like the rest of us. They're trapped at home. Everything sucks. They feel like the world is ending and everyone's just frustrated. But it, like it, it did feel normal to be back in the habit of just doing dumb stuff online and fighting over nothing. So I too would like to thank the fans of that podcast, whatever, whatever its name happens to be. I can't remember at this point. Block party. I think that was it. Block party. No, I I can't remember. Anyway, while I was doing the very important work of fighting with random idiots on Twitter, you, Katie, had something arguably even more exciting going on in that you got married. You know, I, I don't think it was actually more exciting. Um, (laughs) And and, uh, you'll, you'll understand why when I tell you uh, the events. Okay. So As we discussed last time, um, my girlfriend, now wife, and I decided to have a pandemic wedding uh, to avoid, basically to avoid inviting people. And also because uh, she's a nurse who starts in the ICU tomorrow. And, um, you know, this is like a a sort of legal protection in case anything anything happens to her. um, So I can inherit her vast nursing fortune. So... (laughs) We did it up at my cousin's house. My cousin lives like about an hour from here and her neighbor uh, is a, an officiant. So we asked him to like do the legal part and he got like kind of a little bit too into it. So I've been texting with him a lot over the past like week since we hatched this plan. And he like, he really wanted to do like some readings and vows and shit. And like, we didn't want to do it, but he was doing us a favor. So I was like, all right, I'm going to send him a reading and the reading that, and so I like looked through some books. I like read a little bit of like something, something that would be meaningful. Like both of us really love David Sedaris. Like maybe there'd be a David Sedaris passage. We could read like a short one. It didn't really work because he writes short stories, you know, and it's like, it would be like weird to read like three paragraphs from a short story where he's talking about his boyfriend, Hugh. And I don't know. I just like, I couldn't find anything that was appropriate. And then I saw that Barack Obama tweeted Andrew Sullivan's latest column. Um, Did you read Andrew's latest column? No, I, I've been meaning to because I saw it getting passed around. It is fucking dark. It is dark. It's like it's called like How to Survive a Plague, um, which is the, also the name of a movie about HIV or the AIDS crisis. Really good. And movie, Andrew's HIV, yeah, and uh, Andrew's HIV positive. He obviously like lived through the AIDS crisis, um, and so it was just this like beautifully written, but also just like incredibly dark passage. It started out with something about how like. Pretty soon, I'm I'm like bastardizing. He, it, it, the writing was beautiful, but it was basically like pretty soon you're going to start seeing reports of your friends dying on Facebook, and that's going to happen for the next year. So just this like super fucking dark. So I decided that's what we should read for the wedding, and so I I let, like was all prepared for this. Um, our one reading will be this like three paragraphs of Andrew talking about the plague, um, and uh, <laughs> and then um, and then this is probably a good thing. Um, Jay Inslee, our governor, declared a shelter in place um, like the day after I decided that this would be the reading for a wedding, which meant that we would be sort of having to violate the the, the quarantine to do this. Um, so we decided to axe the, the readings entirely just to make it as short as possible, but still like get the legal shit done. 
Yeah, can I wait? Quick question though: Did did Jay Inslee order the shelter in place after he found out what your reading was going to be? <laughs> you know what it is? I think he's homophobic. I think that's what it is. <laughs> Jay wanted to prevent, he wanted to prevent a, a gay wedding. I mean, this is like like we're laughing about this shit, but like it's actually really fucked up. Not the wedding stuff so much. Like you can postpone this, but funerals are now like you can't have a yeah, funeral. Yeah, it's awful. It's so awful. Um, and that like not just like you can't have like a funeral if somebody dies of COVID. Like you can't have any gatherings like and and even worse than that like people are dying in these hospitals totally alone it's just so fucked up anyway um so uh uh where what was i talking about oh yeah my wedding my uh my my nuptial bliss jay insley orders a shelter in place so that means like no readings no vows so honestly like fucking perfect like i had the perfect excuse to write this officiate and say like look i know you want to like really utilized your like church like internet church of of whoever ordained you for like ten dollars on the internet and this feels like meaningful to you but like we've got the shelter in place now so we need to like get this done in under three minutes so the neighbors don't like see and call the cops um so that was great um and then so we headed up there it's like an hour drive and uh, we got about 10 minutes from my cousin's house and realized we'd forgotten the paperwork oh wow so yeah, my uh, so my first act as a as a well, I guess my last act as a single person was to um, forget the paperwork. And when I was driving, so my girlfriend texted my cousin and her neighbor and said, "Like Katie forgot the paperwork, we have to turn around." And I was like, "Excuse me, we're a team now. We forgot the paperwork." <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, but thank you. But other than that, it was like very nice and short and sweet. And everybody stood six feet away from each other and brought their own pens. And we like doused ourselves in Purell afterwards. And the whole thing took like less than three minutes. And then it immediately started hailing and we got in the car and drove home. Um, so that is the, is the story I, we will tell our non-existent grandchildren. Um, it's like, know, it's, it's beautiful in like sort of a certain dark apocalyptic way. And, and you know, congratulations to you guys. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, enough about that. Enough about my COVID wedding. Um, let's uh, get down to business. Let's do it. Okay. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the show is now on Spotify and Stitcher and some of the other big platforms. Um, so definitely search for us there if that's what you use to get your podcast. Um, we should be up on iTunes uh, or Apple Podcasts, I suppose they call it now, by the end of the by the time that you hear this, hopefully, um, unless they decide that you know we're we're too canceled to be on their platform. And we also have a Twitter account, The Bar Pod. That's B A R for blocked and reported. Um, that's a Twitter, The Bar Pod. And we have an email address, blocked and reported podcast at gmail.com, which we are monitoring daily. We are standing by waiting for all of your emails as long as they are nice. Um, and we've already gotten some some smart notes from people. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, and for today's show, Jesse, uh, you wanted to talk about some right wing um, COVID misinformation on Twitter, right? Yeah. And we're going to get we're getting even darker than your apocalypse wedding. Um, so I think you and I have both been accused of literally killing people over our tweets and so forth, right? We've ki- right. literally killed a lot of people. Yes, we are literal Hitlers. We're literal Hitlers. So yeah, the phrase literally killing people gets thrown around a lot on Twitter. But the last few days, like just sitting here cooped up, watching everything unfold, it's it's just been killing me what's going on in sort of the the magosphere, you know, make America great internet about coronavirus. And and you just like you see this thing where this entire different universe is just forming itself before our eyes that that just follows totally different rules of logic and expertise and who can be trusted and who can't. And and it's just, it's really freaking me out because like I've written about, you know, the alt-right and and far-right internet forever. And there's always like this fundamental, I mean, it's going to sound bad, but there is this goofiness to it, right? Like it's not, it's obviously very bad. It helped Trump get elected, but these are just like total weirdo goofballs. But I feel like that sense of goofiness, whatever was remaining of it, has just sort of dissipated for me watching watching people just spread like really crazy misinformation that could literally get people killed. Like you are literally killing people if you don't give them accurate information about the virus. Are you as as worried about this stuff as I am? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm like not spending enough. I'm not spending time like in the Twitter, the Twitter echo chambers that you're spending time in. But I'm not seeing that much of this stuff. Um, so, so please tell me more about it. 
Okay, let me give you just a few examples from Twitter. And and these are, I'm just pulling a few big accounts at random. Um, and for every one of these that, that I know about, there's like a million chat rooms and forums and Facebook groups all sort of disseminating this stuff 24-7. Okay, Ann Coulter, 2.2 million followers. Quote, for people under 60, coronavirus is less dangerous than the seasonal flu, underquote. So below that, she includes a graph which shows the exact opposite, that coronavirus is more dangerous than the seasonal flu for, for older people. Like by a significant margin, um, but of course, like everyone's going to read the text. No one will read the chart itself, and people can really get sick because of this. Or Greg Rubini, some random schmuck with one hundred twelve thousand followers. Quote: I've been saying since twenty days ago that Anthony Fauci, um, that's a brilliant doctor. We'll get back to in a moment. Is a deep deep state piece of Schiff, which is a reference to Trump arch nemesis Adam Schiff. Again, like he's talking about one of the few bona fide experts on TV about this stuff and just, you know, he's part of a conspiracy now. And there's, there's Candace Owens, who is a, you know, of course, a close personal friend of mine. That's a deep cut. It's a deep cut for internet drama. Um, she told her 2 million followers referring to those who heed government social distancing rules, quote, just admit that we are a coddled, fearful, egocentric generation of weak men. So I guess the reason I'm freaking out is like, there's this whole group of people who are just creating this parallel universe in which coronavirus isn't a big deal. And what's been most disturbing to me is watching them go after Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, he's the guy who's been the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984. He's like deservedly become one of the, the sort of figureheads of this moment. You know, he's the definition of a brilliant, dedicated public servant. But, but I read this Washington Post article uh, published Thursday by Isaac Stanley Becker, and it shows like – Trump fans have completely turned on him. And and just because he delivers messages that are often at odds to the president and because WikiLeaks found one instance in which he said something positive about Hillary Clinton, he's not part of the deep state. And deep state just means it's like it's this amorphous term that sort of just means someone who, who the president doesn't like or whose fans don't like. So I guess like at the end of the day, what upsets me about this is is a big swath of the country is in this complete – upside down world in which one public figure who demonstrably does not care about keeping people safe, Donald Trump, is trusted completely and unquestioningly. And there's this other public figure whose story decades long career, which is dedicated to nothing but keeping people safe, Anthony Fauci, he's despised. So I just think that's dangerous. And I also think watching Trump himself, and, and here we'll, we'll get into something I know you want to talk about, watching Trump himself go on TV and say, we're going to try to have everything back open by Easter. And what a great timeline this would be. Easter is our timeline. What a great timeline that would be. That worries the hell out of me because like there's a bunch of people who really trust him. And and why should we not think they're going to get together for like big Easter gatherings? They they are completely disconnected from the actual state of things. And I guess that's why some networks are now saying they're just not going to cover his, his press conferences live, right? So the 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 one uh, station that I've heard of doing this, or one media organization I've heard of doing this so far, is KOW, which is a public radio station in Seattle that I I happen to listen to like ten to twelve hours a day. Um, so they said that they're not going to air his daily pressers anymore. And this is something that I think Jay Rosen at, at NYU, a media critic at NYU, sort of started floating this idea on Twitter that by airing these confer- these press conferences daily, media organizations are allowing Trump to um, to spread misinformation about this public health crisis, and therefore they should stop airing it. So here's here's my take on this. For one, I think that this is an incredibly good marketing move for KUOW because Seattle loves this shit like i live here like (laughs) anything that is that like appears to be anti-trump is going to play really really well um and most of the public radio stations i think including kuw have suspended their spring fundraisers um and so i think in turn and so if i'm being cynical i say like this is a brilliant marketing move on kuw's part because people are going to really respond to this positively here and I'm already seeing this, like lots of people on Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms, just like cheering on KUW for taking this stand. Um, I have a bit of a different perspective. And I say this as a, a, a very a big consumer of public media. I used to work at a public radio station. I got my start in media and public radio. And I have a lot of affection for, for public media. And I also think that they provide a service that, that privately owned or, or publicly traded media organizations don't. And Public radio has a, a very different mission than CNN or The Stranger, where I worked, or you know New York Mag or whatever. You know, and because because public radio, because NPR member stations and public media 
like local public media entities get government funding, they're obligated to be neutral, right? So they have very strict rules about what you can and can't, like what reporters or anybody who's an employee of KUOW, like they are on social media, they have very strict like ethical guidelines about what can and cannot be said. Like you, it's an illusion that they are actually neutral, but I think it's an illusion that's really important in terms of maintaining the ecosystem as it is. Because Public media, public TV, public radio has been under attack from conservatives for decades, for decades, right? And so by taking a stand like this, to me, what this is doing is giving Republicans and Donald Trump in particular, but also Mitch McConnell and the GOP, just great ammunition to uh, to try to defund public media. So I think like in the long run, in the long, in the long run, I think this was a really, a really bad move. So it, it, like short term, it's going to be good for KUW. Long term, I think it's going to be bad for the entire media ecosystem. And also just for me, like as a listener of KUW, I want to hear these, I want to hear Trump's dispatches. I know that he's lying and I don't need it. To, I, I don't need that to be fact checked in real time because I know that he's lying. And I don't think that many KUW listeners are absorbing his press conferences and saying like, oh, Trump said that, you know, things are going to be up and running by Easter. I believe it. So I think that in this case, I don't think that this is going to like do anything to target the people who actually need to get the message that Trump is lying. What it's going to do is make it harder for people like me and other people who listen to KUOW to just listen to him unfiltered, which is what I want. I know that he's lying and I want to hear every fucking word of his horrible, horrible bullshit lies. So to me, like public media is a service and broadcasting the president's idiotic ramblings during a public health crisis is a service, you know, and like it's, terrible that he that he is spouting misinformation but also all politicians spout misinformation including some you know some democrats in this case yeah i mean i guess one example is is bill de blasio he had at least one tweet basically yeah i forget if it was like exactly downplaying but basically saying people should continue to live their lives at a time when it was pretty clear no Right, right. And and people like everybody wanted to be optimistic about this. So I don't fault people for in the very beginning, like trying to say like, no, this is not going to like, be a global pandemic, because nobody wanted it to be a fucking global pandemic. And we all like, we're sort of holding on to that hope. Um, but I just, I don't think that this is helpful for the public to not have access to what the president is saying. So if so, what's going to happen is if the president is giving a presser and I want to listen to it, I'm going to turn off KUW and I'm going to turn on the right wing radio station in Seattle that's actually going to air it. So so I don't even see how this is like long term, how this is going to be good for KUW to be driving people away. I mean, I, I do think that probably they'll see a spike in donations for this. Um, and, but it's been sort of interesting to watch this unfold online because you have a lot of sort of like James Fallows was really was like really into this idea of, of not airing his pressers. And so he tweeted about this and he and he tweeted a list of other sort of very elite media figures who have signed on to this, sort of like an open letter saying like our our you know our station should also should also sign on and refuse to air these pressers. And it just to me it just read as like elite like liberal mainstream media people deciding like people from the New York Times and Fox sort of saying like we know what's best for people and we know what they shouldn't, 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 shouldn't absorb. And I hate that shit. Like, I do not actually think that they're in touch with, um, you know, with the American public and what the American public wants and what the American public can, can, you know, discern what is, what is, what is fact and what is fiction. Obviously, like there are a lot of like hardcore Trump supporters who absorb his every word and that's super dangerous, but they're not going to stop doing it because KUW or CNN or MSNBC stop airing his pressers. It just feels like this is, more tribalism and it's just like i don't know it's just like everything is so fucking divided right now and this to me is just another example of, of like putting a like stake in the ground and saying like our like our political purity our our stance here is more important than what the actual people want um so i like i i i was really disappointed to hear this from kow they say they're going to continue to reevaluate this decision but i my sense is that I bet that this is a very popular decision from within KUOW. I bet their staff like is very happy about this. And I think that's really unfortunate because public radio is not the resistance. It should not be part of the resistance. It should not try to be the resistance. Public radio has a much bigger mission than uh, getting this president out of office. Um, you know, it's a public service. And I, and I think that this is this really distraction from the mission. Okay. And the other thing about this is that they're not just 
you know, censoring Trump or whatever. They're not just air, like not airing Trump. Well, Dr. You know, Anthony Fauci is also speaking at these at these events. So they're also preventing us from getting in like good information from the CDC and other and other governmental agencies because they don't want people to hear Donald Trump. And like to me, like I do not see how that benefits anybody. Yeah, I so I, I'm with you on part of it. I think I'm not with you on the other part. I mean, I, I think you're right. There's this idea that um, a year or two ago, there was a blow up where the New York Times ran an article about this couple. They were basically Nazis. And the way people responded to it, it was as though they, they expected the Times every sentence of this piece to put in parentheses, but being a Nazi is bad. Like Like every step of the way – the journalism outlet has to indicate what what they think is right, even in sort of a neutrally reported news story. So I, I'm very much against that. I think I think you're right that this will this will cause conservatives to freak out. But as you also said, when do they not freak out about public media? I think there's actually like something more fundamental at stake here, though, which is if over and over and over the president delivers dangerous misinformation about coronavirus, and that doesn't mean he's been the only person to do so, but. I don't think I mind there being like a little bit more gatekeeping around that. I guess it would be one thing if we only had three networks in the country, like in the old days, and like all of them simultaneously said we're not covering the president. But the fact is, as you pointed out, like people people who want to listen to the press conference can get the press conference. So I think it's a genuine conundrum, and I think there might be a way to have a slight delay and then present the information he says with some context because I'm just – I'm sufficiently worried about how many people don't even know the basics about how this virus works or the situation that that I don't want them misled about it. But I guess like if if I could put on the hat of the insufferable former philosophy major I am, there's probably some situations hypothetically, like ridiculous ones where you would agree you shouldn't carry a press conference live, right? Like if Trump announced that he was going to pick one American's name from random and and blame them for the virus or something equally outlandish, there's some set of scenarios where you would you would be sympathetic to not covering the press conference, right? Or no? I mean, you'd have to if you set up a straw man like that. I suppose, <laughs> right. yes. But this is specific to public media. I think if CNN or MSNBC wants to wants to not broadcast, I think that's a totally different thing. Um, you know, that's a private that's a privately owned company. They're allowed to do what they want. Um, I just think that public media has a has a greater mission to provide you know information that that impacts the public. And in this case, like the president's idiotic ramblings do. And it just, I, I think that at, but at this point, many people, not hardcore Trumpists, but many people are able to discern what is true and what is fiction from this man in particular. It's not like it's a secret that he's a liar. Um, and I want to hear his lies. I like, I, I just, I want to hear him. I want to know what he's saying. And you know, I don't, I don't need like, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I don't need this to be fact checked in real time for Donald Trump to say, um, you know, Shit's going to be up and running by Easter. Besides the fact that it's not like the like the president saying things are going to be up and running by Easter is actually going to change what's happening in states, right? I mean, I'm incredibly disturbed by the fact that some states, like the states that I live in, or the state I live in, and the state that you live in, is like our lead, our elected leaders are doing everything possible to to flatten the curve. To, prevent and slow the spread of the virus, right? And then you have red states where they're not doing shit, you know? And so it's going to be incredibly like interesting, but also fucked up to see how death tolls compare in Washington state and Texas and Alabama and Tennessee and places like that. Um, So uh, anyway, so, but my point is that like Trump can say, I want the country back and running by Easter. That doesn't change the fact that there is no way that in my state and in your state that that's going to happen because this is, you know, this is kind of coming down to a state, a state issue, not a, not a federal issue, which is, you know, maybe fucked up in its own way, but that's kind of how this has played out. I think it does come down to, to a fundamental level of, I don't know, I hate to say it, but elitism or paternalism, because I, I think yeah. a lot of people are going to be fooled by Trump and, and will have, an Easter get together. And I think that's bad. And I I don't know how to express that without being like the hoity toity East coast college graduate type. But like at the end of the day, some voters have worse or less information than others. And it's so tricky because as you said, like, I don't, there's a lot of situations where I think Vox or the time screws up horribly and and people on the right are now circulating a tweet Vox did saying this wasn't going to become a global pandemic. Like they deleted it, but it does nicely show how like these, these, sometimes haughty authority figures do get stuff wrong. So I think I'm um, 
Yeah, I'm always a little bit torn. I mean, they oft, I mean, like, sorry to interrupt you, but like, think about the fucking 2016 election and the 2020 election. They don't like sometimes get shit wrong. Like they, we, like, we're a part of this. We often get shit wrong. I just, I like, to me, this is another example of media, elite media figures being totally out of touch with the American public. And in, in this paternalistic way, we know what's best for you. We know what's going to happen when it's like, the fact is like, we clearly don't. I mean, I think the media is actually doing a pretty good job right now of reporting on this stuff, but it did take a while. Did you, uh, that's actually a really good segue to the war and stuff. Did you do that on purpose or was that just your naturally, <laughs> your naturally gifted segue style? Um, you know, I am gifted in transitions. I would say that. <laughs> So, okay, let's shift from Trump to someone I don't hate, uh, Elizabeth Warren. Ah, uh, Elizabeth Warren. I, I vaguely remember her. It's familiar. Name sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like that was two months ago. But um, so, yeah, we got an interesting email about Elizabeth Warren from a reader, Thomas Saffel. Okay, so I'm going to read this. Hey, jerks. Can you jerks talk about the weirdness of Elizabeth Warren's supporters? I'm not talking about people who think that she would make a good president. I thought that for a while. I mean, women projecting their every personal struggle onto Warren's bid for the presidency. Her conflicts with Bernie were particularly illustrative. Uh, illustrative. Illust- illustrative? How do you say that? <laughs> Illustri- illustrative. Ill- Her conflicts with Bernie were particularly illustrative of this phenomenon. You know, women saying he reminded them of their abusive exes and, of course, the whole episode about their private conversation over the electability of a woman. I'm influenced by the writing of Christopher Lash, who talked about what he called the therapeutic sensibility. And I think this is a good example of that. The lexicon of therapy, words like trauma and abuse being applied to politics feels like the kind of thing he was talking about. It's so goddamn weird. Also, the Warren tattoos that look like they're from concentration camps is so funny that it might just make me start to believe in a just God. Thomas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe we'll leave that for another day but anyone who just google enter the really weird search term Elizabeth Warren <laughs> concentration camp tattoo and I promise you you'll you'll be distracted from coronavirus for a couple hours anyway I thought this was a very interesting email and Katie you wrote about this very subject didn't you I, well I did sort of I wrote about um, I wrote about whether or not Elizabeth Warren's loss was sexist um, and the conclusion I came to was that it was not I think that She lost for many reasons, um, and most of them can be summed up with, uh, in a simple phrase, she ran a fucking bad campaign. Um, I think she made a series of political miscalculations that really had less to do with her sex and more to do with her messaging. Um, And I think she hired the wrong people, which is sad. I was a big Warren fan before this race, and then she sort of doubled down on, like, like woke identity politics um, when I think that her strengths were really with, you know, in corporate reform. Um... And, uh, you know, consumer protection and stuff like that. But instead, she, like, spent her time talking about, you know, um, how she was going to uh, get a nine-year-old trans child to vet the Secretary of Education, um, which I don't think, like, like you can make it like a, like, if you want to make a moral case for why that's appropriate, go ahead. But um, to me, it's it's not even as much about the moral case as it is about just the fact that it, I think shit like that makes her, like, totally unelectable um, compared to a man like Donald Trump. So she lost me. I did not. I, I did not become a, a Liz Lad after like years of like very much hoping she would be the first woman president. Yeah. Well, I'm generally on the same page, and it was the way this played out online was such an interesting example of that divide between, you know, for lack of a better word, elites, not just writers, but sort of more educated people and everyone else, because Liz Warren did not really come close to winning just about anywhere, including in my home state of Massachusetts, which is you know where she's a senator. So. You had on the one hand the, the big mass of Democratic primary voters being exposed to her and hearing her message. And, and early on, she was up in the polls, I think, approaching front runner status. But she just hit a complete brick wall. She just – it didn't work. Voters did not like her and they chose Biden. But But you had this narrative emerge where – she was so obviously the right person, almost in this objective sense, as though there is a right person, that that the only explanation anyone could come up with was that was misogyny. And I think we both think that misogyny is often a part of outcomes like this, but it's just, it's very strange, A, to attribute a, a pretty resounding failure, not a close call, not like Hillary in 2016, mostly to, to misogyny, which is what people are doing. And second, there was... As, as Thomas was getting at, this very specific therapeutic language where people saw it as a personal slight, if not a trauma, 
that their person had been eliminated from the race. And it's just this very weird personal is political type of language in which outcomes are mostly about what they do to me personally, how I personally feel about that. And, and I found that strange, not least because, as you pointed out, the last Democratic nominee was was a woman and the president before that was a black man. So, Right. And, and the last, like Hillary Clinton, like won the popular vote, this idea that Americans, Democrats in particular, all of a sudden became so sexist, like four years of Donald Trump made people more like make Democrats more sexist. I just like, I don't have any data to back this up, but it just seems illogical to me. Why do you think that um, there's like this cliched phrase you see a lot online, like, I'm so sorry, this is happening to you. And and that's a response to the fact that people uh, on Twitter especially treat everything as though they're being traumatized. This is even for sort of everyday events. Everything is a big show of how how hard things are for me, the person tweeting. Why do you think people are attracted to that sort of language and and people respond the way they do to it? Uh, I you know a part of it I think is sort of narcissism, just like garden variety narcissism. Um, but I also think that like everything else, this is just sort of a meme, uh, you know, a trend that is just like really increased. It, like this, like talking about identity has become something that that happens on a on a not just a daily basis. Like the media is consumed by stories of identity. Um, I think it's just sort of a meme. You know, I know that's not a very good example, but like this has become a trend, and somebody does it, and then more people do it, and more people do it, and all of a sudden we're talking about, you know political candidates losing or like not getting our Amazon packages as like a form of trauma. Um, it's concept creep, I think is part of it. This idea that, you know, something like PTSD, you know, obviously like trauma exists in the world, but these, these concepts that at one point were reserved for these sort of, you know, select groups or, or, or rare instances, um, have just really just spread out into the mainstream. And I think to the detriment of, of society and, uh, you know, and, and to mental health, you know, I think that if you consider everything a trauma, you're going to feel traumatized. I was so shocked by seeing some professional feminist writers tweeting comparisons of Liz Warren losing and, and people not understanding how much it hurt them to have her lose to, to literal sexual assault. I mean, there were there was a handful of these, but they came from actual feminist writers, and it's just like, how fucking inappropriate is that? I mean, every every election cycle, everyone has a favorite, and most people's favorites lose. That that is not in the same universe as being sexually assaulted or even being sexually harassed. And like you're saying, just this concept creep, this this casual conflation of everything bad with everything bad with everything unpleasant is, I think it's really bad. But um. The one final point I wanted to make about this was I actually wanted to read just a paragraph from your your Reason article on this because that, that really, to me, struck an important tone. Quote, when it comes to Gabbard or Klobuchar or the men in the race, people evaluate their campaigns and generally determine it's the candidate, not the voter who is at fault. Gabbard isn't losing because of sexism. She's losing because she's a fill-in-the-blank homophobe, cult follower, Bashar Assad apologist. Klobuchar wasn't a victim of misogyny. She was an uninspiring candidate who abuses her staff and eats her salads with a comb if she can't find a fork. Parentheses equality, I find personally find highly electable. I agree with you on that, Katie. Um, <laughs> yeah, that shows ingenuity. It really does. Absolutely. That's the kind of ingenuity we need to, to defeat the virus, for one thing. But um, <laughs> so that what I find so interesting about this is like, so you have the Bernie bros on one side, these like mean online tweeters who are very aggressively pro-Bernie and ridicule and harass, in theory, anyone who's against Bernie. And then you have... Liz Warren supporters, Liz Lads. We need a female version of that. There isn't one. Call them Liz Lads. Who Liz are uh, Liz Lads? <laughs> I think you could say that, but I can't. Uh, you have the Liz Lads who are um, they're equally invested in Liz Warren. I don't think they're as mean, but they're very invested in her uh, online. And what the two groups have in common is, you know, in both cases, their their chosen candidate lost and hit a brick wall, especially in places like South Carolina and. They don't seem capable of understanding that at root what happened was the Democratic primary voters do not like their candidate. Their candidates did not run good campaigns and are not well liked enough by the Democratic base to win. And I, I just don't like this thing where you blame the voters. You know, th- there's a problem with the voters. Right. It's their misogyny or they're easily conned by the Democratic establishment. I, I just don't think that's good politics or, or sort of as an organizing principle. If you want your movement to succeed, your message can't be the voters are fucking stupid. It, it has to be more positive than that. And, and you're never going to 
build off your losses in productive ways if that's the only message you take away. Right. It's either voters are stupid and they don't know what's good for them. Therefore, that's the only reason they could vote for Biden. Or it's a conspiracy that, you know, the DNC or the Russians or whoever has uh, these these forces have come together to block my personal favorite candidate. I mean, for me, I don't understand why people it's just it's very hard for me to understand why people get so wrapped up in these candidates, these individuals. I hate this like cult of personality shit. I mean, I want there to be a cult of personality around this podcast. But other than that, you know, (laughs) this idea that like a politician is going to is going to, uh, you know, save your life is just it has not it's history crazy. has not shown it to be right i mean and you know when obama was elected i was much younger and dumber then so tw- in 2008 i was like fucking crying you know i mean i i like might cry if like donald trump wins again but um but in that case i had like all of the opt like i remember thinking the day after the election like our problems are solved like he's going to like he's going to shut down guantanamo and i'm going to get health insurance well you know what neither of those things really happened you know Poli- like politicians, the, just the forces that that move this machine are so much greater and so much slower than any one person. That this idea that Bernie Sanders or Liz Warren or whoever is going to fix our problems is just like it. The, the evidence just doesn't doesn't support that, especially because they can't win national elections. Um, so for me, this I don't know. It's it's just sort of off putting to see, especially people in the media rally around these figures like they're like they're you know gods because they're not. Yeah, I don't. So I don't mind like if someone wants to say the difference between Trump winning another term or a Democrat. I mean, to me, that is a huge difference. But I think what you're oh, getting absolutely. at is, yeah, the nar- it's the narcissism of small differences. So by the the time the Warren Sanders online feud became its most heated, you would have thought they were at the opposite sides of the political spectrum. The way their fans talked about them, like it was it was completely insane. Particularly Bernie Sanders supporters treating Liz Warren who. Like at the moment, we would hit the lottery to have a president as progressive as Liz Warren, just given where the country is now. To have a president as liberal as fucking Joe Biden right now would be fine, <laughs> right? Like it—it it turns out that's maybe the best we could hope for. Um, it, it's just to make so much of these fairly small differences. Sanders and Warren were not far apart, but again, this is what online dynamics fuel this stuff, where where you get points for showing how much you love your person and points for showing how much you hate the other person. It, it's not conducive to any sort of real solidarity. Solidarity, I don't think. Yeah, I, I think you're totally right about that. And, you know, primaries are, are contentious and heated. And I think it's fine if people want to, like, get all pissed off during the primary. The problem is that after the primary, when the voters have decided on a candidate you don't like, are you going to show up? Or are you going to stay home and sit it out because you're so pissed at that, you know, that Bernie didn't win? Um, and, like, I have so, like, I have problems with Joe Biden, but I have so little respect for people who say that if, you know, that they will not show up and vote out Donald Trump vote against Donald Trump because their candidate didn't win. You know, to me, like, I, I'm i not generally one to throw around allegations of privilege, but if you are privileged enough to stay home and to think that there is no difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, like, honestly, like, you need to do some fucking self-reflection, Chapo Trap House. <laughs> Just because we haven't alienated... We haven't alienated every possible group. No, I look, I had a DM conversation with a college friend who's genuinely one of the smartest people I know. Um he, in, he's smarter than me. Wow. He's, even me. No, he's smarter than me in many ways. He, he's, he's on that road of the sort of super nihilistic, if it's not going to be Bernie, I'm not, I'm not going to vote for Biden. And I, I am not a huge Biden fan. I just I, – I cannot imagine do, making that decision. And you know what? I'm fine with you throwing around allegations of privilege there because this isn't just about who actually sits in the White House. It's about SCOTUS nominees. It's about all sorts of – you know, the EPA. Who's going to be appointed to the EPA? He's everything. It's about kids being separated at the border from their fucking parents. Like, obviously, like the Obama administration and Joe Biden were not great on immigration, but come on, they're better than Trump. And like, like, I just have to keep like reminding people, not that they ever listen to me. The lesser of two evils is less evil. Like, (laughs) can't you see that? Come on, people. And I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of this is just sort of a, you know, a fuck you vote. People won't vote for Biden because they want to. They want to say fuck you to everybody who did, which is like not how we should be, you know, litigating politics. It's irrational. No, it's not. Um, and again, th- th- this is a point I, t- I try to make often. If your particular belief or ideology is only held by 20 or 25 percent of the population, you are not in a position to sort of exit the system and storm off in a huff and take your ball and go home. Like you will you will fail forever. And 
I'm worried that in some cases, these people and groups sort of, um, that failure is like sort of a, a comfortable blanket. If you just adopt the role of the angry loser who's never treated fairly, that can be your brand. And it sort of is their brand. And they have a lot of fans, at least online and influence. I just, I don't want them doing that. I want them to contribute to pushing the Democratic Party a bit to the left and getting everyone on the same page. And it's just watching this primary unfold has been incredibly depressing. And then we have this weird anticlimax where, you know, the virus hits and it's just sort of suspended. <sighs> I'm too depressed by this. Let's. Uh, yeah. We should maybe we should maybe move on. Right? Well, all right. Last thing about this. I mean, I'm not convinced there, there is going to be an election in November. I mean, all these people could be dead. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not kidding about this. I mean, Boris Johnson uh, tested positive for COVID. Like, fucking these these leaders talk to a lot of people. Um, so we might have to like scratch it all and and, uh, and uh, start it start all over come November. I don't know what's going to happen. What about it? What about a, a Katie Herzog Jesse single unity ticket? I would be fine with that. There's there are no skeletons in my closet, so um, except for that uh, that one skeleton in my closet, but it's <laughs> an actual skeleton. Um, yeah, vote for us. Vote for Blocked and Reported, and rate us on iTunes. I one time got two speeding tickets in three days in upstate wow. New York, so that's my only skeleton. It's now been aired. That is the coolest thing I've ever heard about you, Jesse. <laughs> that's probably true. Okay, so uh, final segment. You wanted to talk about this Washington Post article, right? Yeah. Okay, so on Sunday night, a lawyer, a 56-year-old lawyer in La Mesa, California, named Scott McMillan, um, he was responding to um, an idiotic tweet by Donald Trump. Well, actually, you know what? It's not that idiotic. The tweet is, "We can." this is what Trump said, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. That seems like a good idea. Like, you know, if you, you don't want to, like... Um, you know, uh, cure a broken leg by cutting off somebody's leg or whatever. So broadly speaking, that's fine, but it's Donald Trump. So like, we know that there's, <laughs> so we know, we know that there's nothing good can come of this. Okay. So Scott McMillan, who I assume is a Trump supporter responded to this. And he said, quote, the fundamental problem is whether we are going to tank the entire economy to save two, to save 2.5% of the population, which is one, generally inexpensive to maintain, and two, not productive, right? So what he's saying here is all of these shutdowns, all of this this like massive effort that people are making to quarantine, um, which is obviously like, like wrecking havoc on the economy, this isn't worth it because... The people who are going to die are unproductive. It's a small percentage of the population, and they're they're old, basically. So, like, why destroy the economy to save to save the grandparents? Um, which is something a lot of people have been sort of discussing. And and I actually don't think there's anything wrong with discussing the sort of trade offs about what's happening because these trade offs are super super massive. Um, anyway, so uh, so he got like dogpiled on Twitter as one would expect. So Mark Fisher, this author. Um, so he decides to write about this dog pile and about sort of the, and, and, and the take there, the sort of contrary intake, um, let's let the grandparents die to protect the economy. And so he writ- writes a piece about it. And this is the, the tweet that he writes to accompany the, the link that he posted on Twitter. Scott McMillan, a 56 year old lawyer tweeted that it's more vital to revive the economy than save people who are quote, not productive, like the elderly and infirm. So I called his parents. Okay. Bad fucking move, buddy. So there are at right now there are seven thousand about seven thousand likes on this post. There are five thousand replies. Um, so I guess he didn't technically get ratioed, but he got fucking dogpiled for sure. And if you read the Washington Post article, it's like it's it's much more nuanced than this. I think the article is actually fine, and it doesn't seem like he like saw McMillan's tweets and then like called his parents out of the blue to like tattle on him. What seems like happened is that he interviewed McMillan about this dogpile and about his sort of perspective on this, got permission to talk to his parents, and then called the parents and interviewed them. But he tweeted it in this way that makes him look like it just like it hits all the sort of marks of like the awful, like elite media tattling on people, which is something that has happened, you know, like, you, like daily beast will find out that a bakery at like, at, or sorry, that a baker at, at um, you know, at Mar-a-Lago is a QAnon supporter and write like 2000 words as though this is a fucking expose. Like this shit does absolutely happen. But his piece I thought was actually fine. His tweet, however, just duck his 
face in it. Um, and then so he got totally dogpiled. And so the story became one that was about like the horrible mainstream media, you know, tattling on people for having these sort of different, different basically picking on a conservative is basically what it what it came down to. Um, but the whole thing was like very like interesting to watch unfold. Um, and also a great reminder that people uh, don't read the piece, they only read the headline and the tweet. And if you're going to have a like long nuanced piece, and you don't want people to react like that, you probably shouldn't like accompany it with an inflammatory tweet and implying that you tattle on somebody um, doing something stupid on Twitter. Yeah. But it's tricky though, right? Because like, um, uh, there's a clashing incentives because if you don't put an inflammatory headline, I still think you probably get more readers, even if they're hate readers, if you put the inflammatory headline on there. But I, I agreed with you. Like I read it, expecting to be pissed off or think it was ridiculous but I, i'm like all for taking someone who looks like an online troll and like trying to get the human side of them and it did that what was kind of weird was the the journalist went out of his way to show that scott's elderly parents weren't completely useless to society as though that was in yeah. question it was like like it it, so the article, like, it, it acted as though the reader coming in was convinced by Scott's tweet that the elderly are useless and should be turned into food or something. So it took it spent like several paragraphs laying out the ways in which his parents aren't useless, which I just found weird journalistically. Like, I don't think anyone's going to come in assuming his parents should actually be sacrificed to coronavirus. But but yeah, it, it was an interesting article, and I, I I'm a fan of reporting on online dog online dog piles, which I've done, but. Yeah, there is. It definitely sort of the public facing part of that article on Twitter. You know, I saw like a Fox News write up just basically about that tweet that I don't think was really about the article, but more about the way it was presented as like this, you know, quote, left wing tattletale or whatever, making sure no one does mean tweets. Right, right. And yeah, I mean, when I saw, uh, you know, and then, and then that, that becomes a meme in itself. So all of a sudden, like, there's this, I, I saw the meme before I saw the piece. So I saw people tweeting about, you know, calling, you know, calling someone's parents, um, and didn't realize what it was about. And it took a little while to like, figure out actually what was going on. And then when you read the piece, it's like, come on, like, is this really, is this really something that people want to get pissed about? And the guy, Scott McMillan, like, he, he, you know, he sort of defended the reporter. He said, like, oh, no, like, I was okay with this. Like, I gave per permission or whatever. Um, but, of course, that doesn't really matter. Because people don't read the articles. We just, like, read the headlines. Um, maybe, you know, I might start just, like, be I might just become a headline writer. You know, like, I'm on furlough now. I don't have uh, that much work to do. So maybe I'll just collect a bunch of headlines and stop, like, actually crafting essays and just do, like, you know, copy pasta or whatever in the base of the, uh, the text of the post. And um, come up with an inflammatory headline. It might be good for my career. Yeah, but but this help, this podcast already makes fifty thousand dollars a week, so I don't I don't think you yeah. need to do that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. We're just uh, we we can retire now. Uh, do you? Is there an argument that? Do, are you of the mind that as soon as someone tweets something publicly, even if they're not a public figure, it's fair game for journalists to like treat it as a news event? Because when I checked. This guy post blow up only had like 550 Twitter followers. So, for all I know, he was in like the double digits when this started. He 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 was sort of a nobody from a uh, the a news perspective, right? Yeah, no, I definitely don't think that that's fair game. Um, I think it's a a waste of time. But I also think part of that is like just a, a byproduct of the 24 hour news cycle and having not just sometimes daily deadlines, but sometimes multiple deadlines a day. Um, and so journalists are constantly like trying to find content instead of like going to school board meetings or whatever. We like troll Twitter for shit to write about, which I'm absolutely guilty of, but we can, you know, we can ruin people's lives for one thing. Um, and we can also create more tension and drama and tribalism than, than we need to. Um, you know, and I, and I get the impulse, like it's fun to write about this stuff and I certainly do it. But for me, I've definitely taken a step back from like writing about outrage unless there are consequences um, that I think should be reported on. And sometimes are, and in this case, I think the piece actually was a good exploration of online drama and also this sort of contrarian idea that we should um, let old people die. Um, and this is an idea that people have, like it should be talked about. 
Um, yeah, but it, there's definitely a danger in that. And I think, of, you know, a big part of that is like, social media and this sort of insane deadlines that people have. I mean, before the internet, you know, so the paper that I work for, which is now like uh, maybe going out of business because of the pandemic, um, and there have been like mass layoffs in, across the industry in the last couple of weeks. So before the internet, uh, my paper, The Stranger, my colleagues who were there, who worked at the paper, you know, 15, 20 years ago would have had one deadline a week, right? Because of a weekly paper. So you have one, you write one article a week. Granted, it takes a lot longer to read that article or to write that article because you don't like have the internet to like do your research and shit. But, or I guess they might've had the internet, but not social media. Now we have a deadline a day or two deadlines a day. Um, so it's just like the amount of labor has gone way up while at the same time, the amount of time that you can dedicate to your work has gone way down. Um, and so I think a lot of this sort of the hot takes of this variety are just a byproduct of like trying, like you just have to turn shit over really, really quickly. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a completely exhausting time to be a writer. If you have like a staff job anywhere, even I think the pace was slower um, when I was at New York mag, you know, two and a half years ago now, but even I remember, I mean, just, just writing two quality things a day is not uh is not easy. Yeah. I, I also, it's not, I, for me, it's like not possible. I cannot write two quality things a day. I can maybe write two quality things a week and then fill it up with a little bit of bullshit. Um, it just, it's really, really difficult. And, and you know, like it's, it's a really difficult time to be a staff writer. It's fucking harder to be a freelancer. Yeah. I mean, the number of quality freelancers out there is really high. It's really hard to get your, you know, unless you're sort of famous, it's really hard to get sort of to get your pitches read. Um, the competition is endless and you don't get paid shit. No. So learn to code. <laughs> learn to code. Also, I just, I think we should, um, we're in the early days of this podcast. We're trying to give it a brand identity on the question of whether old people should be murdered. Uh, I don't want to speak for you, but I think as a podcast, as an institution, we're, we're against that, right? I mean, it depends on the old person. That's true. That's I think we true. should be we should we should like make room for subtlety and nuance in this. Um, you know, Jesse, I think I think that's our brand. Shades of gray. I, I think if if at this early juncture we lay down a strong anti-murdering old people uh, talking point down the road, we don't want to have to flip flop on that. So I think you're right. We should leave it a little bit more open ended. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably wise. Uh, on that note, or was there anything else you wanted to uh, to talk about? No, I think I get, I think I'm good. I gotta go. Um, go do some quarantine prep. I um, so it turns out that I've gotten into foraging. Um, in the last uh, last couple of years, like I do mushroom hunting and shit like that. Um, but so you know, with this pandemic and having like lots of time, but not lot lots of like places to go. I've been doing some foraging for um, stinging nettles, which are like good in pesto and uh and like make good tea and stuff like that so um last week i i went out and i i forged a bunch of stinging nettles and then yesterday and like made a bunch of tea and i've been drinking it all week and then yesterday i found out that whatever i forged was not stinging nettles <laughs> <laughs> you um, wait so, so what, what did you drink are you <laughs> i have absolutely no idea um, but I have a bunch left if you want some. I can send it to you. Yeah, please FedEx it. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Remember, we are The Bar Pod on Twitter, Blocked and Reported Podcast at gmail.com. I'm Jesse Single, and remember, Blocked Party stole our idea for a podcast and should be immediately arrested for Grand Theft Audio. And I'm Katie Herzog. And also remember, it's not old people who are unproductive members of society, it's toddlers. <laughs> <laughs>